Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert with another episode of Doctor Podcasts, and I'm currently on the Twitter platform, which is rapidly becoming the most prominent video platform on the internet. Today, I am pleased and honored to have uh, a guest who's one of the top retina doctors in all of New York City and the New York City metropolitan area. It's Dr. Ari Pollock. Dr. Pollock is a retina specialist. He's a clinical assistant professor of ophthalmology at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine and also at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine and also at the New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, all here in New York City. Uh, Dr. Pollock is a workaholic, I know, because he's always available to see patients 24-7, and he's always able to help other doctors with patients who have retina problems. So I'm really pleased to have him here, take some time to uh, spend with us and talk about retina today. Retina is a part of the eye, which we'll discuss in a moment. The uh, retina is a very important part of the eye, which basically sends messages to the brain. But unfortunately, the retina can have problems. So today we're going to discuss things like macular degeneration, how diabetes affects the retina, something called diabetic retinopathy, and things like retinal detachment and, and other things. So, uh, Dr. Pollock, thanks very much for taking the time today to Well, of course. Um, uh, the pleasure is all mine, and um, I think we're going to have a great time here today. Absolutely. And the audience, yeah. uh, we got rave reviews on our first uh, I, I saw podcast. the first the first episode. It was awesome. It was outstanding. Yeah. I'm very honored to be the second guest. Yeah. So it's... I feel it's like great. a trailblazer. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's let's talk about the retina. Could you tell us what the retina is and and what part of the eye it's in? And sure. We have a actually a model of the. Uh, so that's a good place to start. We can start with the model here today. That's great. So and, uh, just gonna open this up here. Well, there's our lens. Right. This is actually a surgery that we do. This is actually a drop nucleus. Right. Exactly. Sometimes the cataract doctors make mistakes and the right. nucleus falls down, and we then we have to go and uh, we have to then go and uh, and uh, phaco emulsify. You know, retrieve it. Retrieve it. Well, remember, retrieve it. We we right. use the phaco fragmentome and we emulsify it right. and uh, and we take it out basically. So um, essentially, this is the uh, the retina is really the posterior or the back portion of the eye. So here. Right over here is the optic nerve. And what the retina is, is a very special neurosensory layer of tissue that produces a photochemical response, a, a really a neurochemical response, in response to light, transmits this message to the brain through the optic nerve. And the brain then registers this as an image or a little bit like a series of pixels so uh, people can better understand. It's essentially, essentially most like the digital chip in a, in a camera. Right. So That's in the old days, for, for the audience... Or that, film, or the film of a camera in the old right, days. Right. For the audience right. that remembers film and camera, the retina is like the film in the old-fashioned cameras. It, it gets the message, and yeah, then it, so. it sends it to the brain. Uh, but it's it's very sophisticated. And interestingly, a large part of the brain is devoted to vision. That's of course absolutely true. The whole occipital lobe, there's the occipital lobe, just the, neuro, the just the way that the uh, optic nerve eventually transmits the message through the thalamus up to the through the occipital lobes. It it is it is crucial, right. really. Uh, but the source of all that vision is the retina, right? And you only get one of them right now at this point. One in each eye. One in each eye. So you can get as many lenses as you want. You can get as many corneas as you want, <laughs> but you only get one retina. <laughs> right, the retina is actually uh, neural tissue right. like the brain. So if there's any damage Absolutely. to the retina, it, it can't Which is be why these diseases either. that we're gonna discuss are so important. Right. So many of my patients ask me, what is the macula? They, they sometimes so confuse macula with a disease. It, Can you right. explain so, what the macula is? So the, mac, the anatomic macula on this diagram here is really the point, the area in between the arcades, which are the blood vessels that emanate from the optic nerve. But what's really significant about the macula is the macula is the part of the retina that is the central part of the retina, which is then even the fovea, that is very cone-dense, 
And because it is so condensed, this is the part of the retina that we use to, um, to read, to recognize faces, to, um, uh, to watch television. So if there's something wrong with the macula, then the patient's central vision is going to be horribly impaired. Right, so the macula is the most important the part is the of the The macula is the most important part of the retina. It's that's, in the center It's in the, of the center retina. of that's correct. Right. Yeah. Without that, you can't drive, you can't that's watch right. TV. That's right. You can't go to Twitter and that's see right. Dr. Podcast. That's right. You can't do, it, can't do any of that. Can't do any of that. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, interestingly, uh, you spent many years learning how to be a physician. You right. went to medical school. You yeah. did a residency in ophthalmology. Mm-hmm. And then you became a retina specialist. Can you tell us how much training is required to become a retina specialist? Well, you have to go through the normative four years of medical school, one year of internship, three years of ophthalmology residency, and another two years of a fellowship. That's a lot of training. And during the fellowship, you learn surgery as you learn both. You, you, my, my fellowship actually was fairly extensive, and we did both medical retina and surgical retina. I was actually the only fellow for two years. Really? So, yeah. So uh, we was there. We were you know, really, you know, very busy, and uh, uh, I learned an incredible amount during my fellowship. Right. But um, we learned. We did both surgery and surgical retina and medical retina in my fellowship. Yeah, you have pretty amazing credentials. I should mention well, that uh, Dr. Pollock right. went to Harvard Medical School, which is the top medical school in the USA, if if not the whole world. So his credentials are amazing, and now he's. Uh, uh, clinical assistant professor at two major medical schools in, in New York City. So it's quite an accomplishment. Well, thank you. Uh, tell us, though, go back a little further. Why did you decide to be a doctor in the, in the first place? Well, I'll tell you, my, my dad was an ophthalmologist, and my mom, my mom is a professor. And I, I really had no choice. If I didn't go into medicine, I would have slept in the garage. That was the, <laughs> the, that was the choice. Either, either, either sleep in your bed or go to the garage. That was it. So I, I, I really didn't, I don't know that I really had a conscious decision necessarily, but I, I do know though that really from the time that I, of my earliest memories, I, I was going to medical school. <laughs> so it was never, but yet, Obviously, I went to college and still had to decide what to do. And medicine really uh, appealed to me because I thought that it was just a, a great way to spend your life taking the, um, you know, the, the uh, apex of technology and fusing that with really helping people and, uh, and, um, and really synthesizing science, medicine, science and, uh, and, uh, and in some ways humanity all the humanities and in, into into one profession. And I, I just thought that would be a pretty cool way to spend my life. Sounds like an easy decision to really? me. It was either garage or Harvard garage Medical, or Harvard Medical School. School. That was it. Those are the two, yeah, those I, the two I choices. Would, I would have yeah. picked Harvard as yeah. well. But obviously, you had to be right. uh, brilliant to get into there. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, Speaking of the retina and macula, Mm -hmm. one of the most common diseases that we see now in senior citizens is something called macular degeneration, which is talked about a lot. Can you tell us what macular degeneration is? Well, that's that's a that's a great question. There's 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 billions of dollars of research that I think has been uh, spent on defining exactly what causes macular degeneration and why it happens. But generally speaking, there are two kinds of macular degeneration. There's the dry kind of macular degeneration and the wet kind of macular degeneration. And the dry kind of macular degeneration, essentially, for some reason, as we get older, just the cells kind of just just atrophy and, and, uh, and wither. The, in the wet kind of macular degeneration, new blood vessels grow under the retina, these blood vessels then leak and bleed and scar. Hmm. Bad, bad thing. Bad, it very, occurs mostly in senior citizens, though, right? Absolutely. So um, the incidence, if you take a look at the overall incidence of macular degeneration, say of, of it actually can happen in, in younger patients as well, but often in younger patients, uh, there, could, there could be some form of genetic disease that causes some form of macular degeneration, but that's a little bit different. But even still, a cross-sectional prevalence of macular degeneration throughout the country is probably about 12%. So even people- Above uh, age 65? No, 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 above age 65 is much much worse. Much worse. It's 12% above about 45. 
Actually. Really? Yeah. But for, above wow. 45, it's 12 percent. Above um, 85, for example, it, it approaches 50 percent. And it's above 45. I would say that there's an, an increase in incidence of one to two percent per year. Wow. Yeah. So what's the current theory? Is it vascular, lack of blood supply, some, some right. other well, issues? The, the dry and the wet are, are probably are probably a bit different. The dry macro degeneration right now, uh, there is it, it's a multifactorial entity right now. Uh, overaction of, of complement seems to be of the complement cascade seems to be uh, what drug manufacturers are going to target for the for the dry. The wet is some form of ischemia that produces a molecule called VEGF, which is very popular in the press. And which this is how it really relates to treatment, that the treatment for wet consists of injections of an anti-VEGF, a molecule that blocks VEGF, that makes the bleeding go away. It's interesting. What's the treatment for the dry type of macular degeneration? Well, as, as we are learning more, actually some of the classifications are even being revised, really. You know, even as we speak. And um, the treatment has always been, really since 2000, vitamins, where vitamin, vi vitamin C, vitamin E, zinc, lutein, zeaxanthin, leafy green vegetables, uh, these really um, do help. They, they do provide some benefit, perhaps up to, d depending on, on, the, on the study, uh, and depending upon whether it was the, the study was called AREDS, age-related eye diseases. There was AREDS 1 and there was AREDS 2. In AREDS 2, they, um, they, they, they put it, they, they replaced uh, beta carotene with, uh, with, um, with lutein mm -hmm. and, and zinc, actually. So the, with the AREDS 2, they actually did get a little bit better, um, better protection. So with the AREDS 1, Overall, there was about a 7% protection with the vitamins of, of absolute benefit. Of relative benefit, it could have gone as high as up to 20%. Right. In a lot this, of my uh, elderly yeah. patients right. uh, take that. If right. you don't have macular degeneration, but you have a parent or a sibling that right. has macular degeneration, is there right. any benefit in taking the AREDS2 vitamin? No. It, the dosage is far too high. Uh, if the, the criteria really to take uh, an AREDS2 vi vitamin are really juicin, which are waste products, essentially protein, cholesterol, that get deposited largely under the retinal pigment epithelium, which is a very special layer of skin under the retina. And they have to be essentially a certain number and a certain size where, it would really where the patient would really benefit. But if somebody just has risk factors, the AREDS uh, vitamins, are the, the dosage is way too high. And uh, it'll it'll burn a hole through your stomach eventually with time, especially in a young in a young patient, mm. you know. So so I but I would I would tell them to just take a regular vitamin, to take a regular multivitamin, and um, and uh, and they could supplement with lutein, which is pretty much pretty much harmless, right. of five to ten milligrams, and eat a lot of le leafy green vegetables, things like spinach, yeah, spinach kale. broccoli, exactly, anything that's green. If it's green, it's right. good. And cigarette smoking. Cigarette makes smoking it worse, is a disaster. Right? right, cigarette smoking makes it worse. Actually, I would tell them uh, to actually to control their lipids too, control their cholesterol. High cholesterol also makes it worse, as well as hypertension. Hypertension also makes dry macular degeneration worse. Does diabetes so, make macular degeneration no. worse? No. No. So it's yeah. most of the aging diseases kind of clump together, clump together. and right. make each other worse. Right. Yeah. Right. And how do you treat? The wet macular degeneration, so, you mentioned the injections. Right, so the wet macular degeneration has been around for many years. It's already 20 years already. But there's some form of anti-VEGF. There have been many uh, on the market. You know, they, ex they really extend from Lucentis or, or Ilea. Uh, Avastin. These have been the the uh, really the famous How ones. How often do patients need to have well, that's, these injections? That's, a, that's an excellent question. So the focus really right now is trying to get patients – to have as few injections a year as possible. So uh, there are uh, newer medications that came out that are all over uh, television. There's Vibismo that, that according to, their, according to, according to uh, the studies, allows patients to get out, allows about 50 to 60% of patients to get out to at least, uh, to at least four months, and some can even get out to six months. 
That's pretty good because I it's remember when right. the injections first started. They were monthly. monthly. You need monthly, but so even now, still, even with the Bisbo, you have to, you have to load them with an injection every three months, right. and then you can, then you can extend. I, I understand there's a form of dry uh, degeneration called uh, geographic atrophy, and there's a new drug for that. Is that right? That that is correct. There there are two new drugs coming out on the market for um, for geographic atrophy. They both uh, target complement. One targets C3, one targets C5. Uh, one is called Cyphofre, uh, and the other uh, is called Zemura. So these uh, agents should be out pretty soon. But what these agents really do, though, is they really slow the slope of progression for the most part. So, I mean, the numbers are, it, it's by no means a cure, but it gives more area under the curve uh, where vision, where vision is preserved. Right. But the, the point though is, is that the best patients for this are patients where the zones of atrophy or, or wasting away are close to the center of the vision and are not, have not involved the center of the vision because once the center of the vision is involved, it's too late. But right. if these zones are close to the fovea, then there may be some benefit uh, towards, um, you know, towards, uh, not, a, not a, terribly uh, statistically significant benefit, but there is some benefit, some benefit. Some, there is some benefit to it. Bottom line, yeah. if you have macular degeneration or if you have a close right. family member who has it, see a retina specialist like Dr. Pollock and right. make sure you're monitoring right. that uh, very carefully. Um, and we uh, also mentioned that you're a New York Eye and Ear Infirmary in Mount Sinai, and right. you're part of the trauma service yes. at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary here in Manhattan. Can you explain what that is? Sure. So um, it's a really a, a few very, very talented uh, surgeons, for the most part, <laughs> um, really, for the most part, take their own time and really uh, devote it uh, to the hospital and, and really to the city. And to the and this is why the infirmary is really such an important place, where essentially all the trauma that happens in the in the greater New York area, uh, is is uh, is is really referred to New York Eye and Ear Infirmary, and we do things like take out foreign bodies. There's like metal on metal injuries where shards of nails get gets uh, basically perforates the globe and uh, lodges. Uh, in the vitreous cavity or lodges in the retina, and these have to be removed. Uh, these right. also cause retinal detachments. They cause uh, massive vitreous hemorrhages. They cause choroidal hemorrhages. And um, these patients are very, very skillfully dealt with at New York Eye and Ear Infirmary. So you're there in the middle of the night, the, right. 4th of July night, right. treating patients who've had firecracker right. injuries or who were hammering a nail and part of the nail broke and went yeah. into their eye or were using a power tool. Right. And a piece of metal flew that's, into their eye. That's essentially what happens, yeah. Right. That's yeah. why I said he's a yeah. workaholic doctor, because so, you can always find him on the holidays right. in the hospital helping yeah. patients out. Yeah. That's that's a, a sign of dedication. That's fantastic. Um, I want to move on to another thing that sure. many of my patients have and is talked about commonly. And recently, we've right. heard there's a diabetes epidemic in of the course. USA and around the world. Right. And many patients develop something called diabetic retinopathy. Can you explain what that is? Of course. So as we know, diabetes is both a endocrine disease, a blood sugar disease, and it's also a vascular disease. Right. This is the reason why patients with diabetes have a higher incidence of heart attacks. They have a higher incidence of stroke. They have their, their feet get amputated. They have kidney disease. Yeah. It's because there's small vessel disease that, that the blood vessels get occluded. So this happens uh, in the retina. And what happened, the retina is very small blood vessels. And these blood vessels get occluded. And when they get occluded, new blood vessels grow. And these new blood vessels unfortunately bleed and form scar tissue. And when they bleed and form scar tissue, they can pull on the retina and they can detach the retina. And uh, this is a, would produce a classic traction retinal detachment. The, in response to diabetes as well, the blood vessels of, of the inner lining of the blood vessels, the endothelium becomes porous and proteins leak, serum and proteins leak out into the interstitial space of the of the macula and produce macular edema so patients with diabetes can lose vision from both of these processes 
how often should a patient who's been diagnosed with diabetes or mm -hmm. pre-diabetes see right. their ophthalmologist? So it depends on the extent of retinopathy, essentially. Uh, if they really have no retinopathy, then they can really just need to be seen once a year. Uh, if they have minor retinopathy, then they can be seen every, every three months. But if they begin to have like, at least moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy, then they need to be seen every three months. So at a minimum, if you have diabetes or you're pre-diabetic right. or your A1C blood test levels are elevated, uh, see an ophthalmologist. And right. if you have diabetic retinopathy, you should see a retina right. specialist like you, right? H happy to treat them. Right. It makes up a large part of my practice. Now, you also treat with lasers, right? Well, we treat with lasers. We treat with lasers, and we treat as well with the same injections that we treat with macular degeneration because the VEGF molecule is really the molecule that gets um, produced in response. It was one of the many molecules, but right now, conceptually, the major molecule that gets produced in response to ischemia. And the, the same injections that work for macular degeneration work for diabetes as well. So, so it's an excellent question that you asked. Before the injections uh, became prevalent 20 years ago, we, laser, was a, was a very, laser was the only treatment that we had. So for macular edema, we would treat the areas of thickened macula with very fine points of laser, also attempting to close the microaneurysms. And we would also place something called pain retinal photocoagulation, which are larger retinal spots that would essentially alter the circulation. It's a complex process, but it would reduce the ischemia and it would reduce the new blood vessels. I still think that there's, that the, that there's still a role for both, actually. And the, it certainly cuts, laser, in my opinion, certainly does cut down on the number of injections and the frequency of injections. And if done properly, uh, laser ca can work very well. I have some patients that are very squeamish and won't, don't want injections. And um, there are certain techniques with micropulse laser, but not quite using the micropulse laser as the micropulse laser. Really, you just using very short bursts of laser that barely make a spot, uh, in my experience, helps tremendously to control the diabetic macular edema. And the injection also lets us put in less heavy laser. So it's really, a, it's really a, so many of the complications that existed with the heavy laser over the years are really avoided because you don't have to put in such heavy laser as we used to, as there's really a synergy between, between the two. So right. it's a f there's a fusion between the two and a synergy. You mentioned the word ischemia a few times. That right. means a reduced blood reduced supply, blood supply. Re right. reduced oxygen to yeah. the retina, and then right. the retina suffers uh, right. consequences. Yeah. What benefit is there of controlling your blood sugar or keeping your A1C blood tests low right. to prevent so, the diabetic complications? So that's crucial. That's, that's completely crucial. If you, if, again, if you take a look at the classic studies, um, 66 percent of the of the whole treatment of diabetics depends on the patient's uh, good blood sugar control with the hemoglobin A1C of, of 6.4 or less, and and in fact for every one for for every one percent of hemoglobin A1C that's above seven. Okay, so let's say somebody presents with a hemoglobin A1C of eight, their chance of running into trouble over the years even perhaps even goes up to as high as 50%. Right. And, and it, it trouble could be total trouble could loss be total of loss of vision. Code trouble could be vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, trouble could be uh, you know, serious problems. So it's really crucial for um, for for uh, for diabetics to control the sugar. One of I remember one of my mentors in fellowship used to explain to the patients that that we can when we didn't even have the the VEGF drugs, when we, when laser was the only uh, entity, and he used to tell them that that uh, that if you don't control your sugar, it's kind of like like swimming against the tide, where eventually the tide right. is just going to catch you. We can put in laser to control the tide, but if the sugar is not controlled, eventually the tide's going to come back, and the bleeding's going to start again. And, and we're going to have to put in more laser or do surgery or do something more aggressive. Right. Very important. Now, yeah. these days, there's a lot of news about new drugs, Ozempic, right. Right. Wegovi, Runjaro. These are right. drugs that 
control the blood sugar. They also cause very significant uh, weight loss right. and have some beneficial cardiac, cardiovascular effect. What's the effect on the eye and patients with diabetic so, retinopathy so from that's, Ozempic? I'm sorry. So that's a great question. That's an, that's an awesome question because, as you said, it's really very, very, very popular right now. So in the, in the long run, uh, the, the likelihood of better blood sugar control will, would likely be that, that uh, the retina is more stable and that the diabetic retinopathy is, it w- would regress. But in the short run, as we know from patients with bariatric surgery, as well as, from, as well as with patients that have had uh, pancreas transplants, where all of a sudden they're getting intensive uh, blood sugar control. And, uh, and this happens over a relatively short period of time. Paradoxically, the retinopathy actually gets worse over a short period of time. So if it drops so if too it drops, rapidly. If it drops too rapidly, the patients could experience fairly significant progression. Which, uh, is, which is more so correlated with patients who have a long-term history of diabetes, as well as patients who have poor uh, control and have hemoglobin A1C of 9.4% or more. So it's really so important to be monitored carefully. In the last two weeks, yeah. I've seen, I had one patient last week mm-hmm. who lost 90 pounds right. in six months yeah, from yeah, that's, Ozempic. I've seen, I've seen I, many I, of these patients, yeah. I couldn't even it's, recognize it's, her. It's, I know. Yeah. And I had another patient yeah. a week before who lost mm-hmm. 40 pounds yeah. in, in six months. Right, right. Uh, so yeah. they one of them was diabetic. Right. Um, yeah. I didn't see any retinopathy. The right. other one is, is not diabetic but yeah. used it for weight loss. So right. uh, anyone who's losing a lot of weight with Ozempic or the other drugs, Wigovi, Munjaro, should be followed by their ophthalmologist, especially if you've had dramatic weight loss and also dramatic drop in the A1C blood test. Could you explain what the A1C blood test is since we've mentioned it several S- times? Several, sure, yeah. So the A1C blood test is essentially what happens in diabetes is that the, um, the red blood cell, when it gets glycosylated by high sugar, is not quite the same red blood cell as a regular red blood cell. So what happens is there's a certain percentage, so to speak, of, of, A1, of, uh, of, glycosylated, uh, of glycosylated blood cells that, are dete- that the, the lab is basically able to detect and produce that as a function of control of, of diabetes, of diabetic right. retinopathy. So ideally, diabetics should be below 6.4. 6.4 6. should, should be the number, yeah. Right. All right. Yeah. That, that's great. Yeah. Uh, good to know. Um, tell us, you know, doing retinal surgery. I, I do eye surgery, but right. I'm always amazed by retinal surgery even more. I don't right. do retinal surgery. I'm not a retinal mm-hmm. specialist because you're dealing with an extremely sensitive, very thin part of the eye that's incredibly sensitive to any touch or manipulation. Tell us about the surgical skills that you need to do surgery on the retina. Well, I I think that the most important surgical skill is outstanding judgment. That has to be uh, employed within often split second decisions. That's, I think, the most, that's the most important thing. The actual Manual surgical skill is is very difficult too. It takes it takes right. a while to really be able to peel membranes and to uh, and to uh, really fix retinas the the right way and to fix macular holes and uh, to get good ILM peels. You're talking about these are things that are microns in size, and it does take some time to be able to to really become facile uh, at it and to be able to do it effectively and quickly. But that that part always comes, I, th- I think. You know, the technical part always comes. Uh, the it's always the it's the judgment, being able to read the defenses, so to speak, that I believe is really the most uh, critical part of being an outstanding retina surgeon. You you were telling me about the football analogy. That's right. To yeah, doing to retina, doing retina surgery. Right. I it's thought like, that was fascinating. Yeah, yeah. T- so, tell me about. So that. I mean, yeah. once you get to a certain level, like for example in the NFL, I think there's every guy who plays quarterback, every quarterback can put the ball where they have to put it. Otherwise, they never would have gotten through high school, they never would have gotten through college. Right. But it's, it's being able to read complex defenses and being able to, to uh, pick them apart that really, makes the great, that really makes the great quarterback. Not to throw interceptions. You know, that's really what, uh, what really makes uh, so the great retina surgeon. So basically, so, you're like the Tom Brady so, of ophthalmology. Okay. Is that right? Uh, listen, hey, I won't, I won't refuse the analogy, but... Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> that's that's but, a great but, point. Judgment. But, but judgment, yeah. But also, right, absolutely. Judgment is the most uh, most important thing. Yeah, I've trained you many know? residents in right. eye surgery, not yeah. retina, but in cataract right. surgery, corneal right. transplants, et cetera. Uh, some of them have very excellent right. hand skills right. and are really good, but they get to a point where what do I do now? They don't know what right. to do. And that's where my judgment comes, comes in. in. I absolutely. tell them, okay, yeah. here's what you do next right. to do the surgery right, right and right. get a good result. With time, they eventually learn that, most right. of them. But don't get me wrong. I mean, it's it's kind of like a bit the analogy that, that you know, the program directors have classically used was, was really more that it's flying. It's like flying an F-16 airplane. You know, because really what you are doing, you're using both your feet as well, right? You're using... Uh, one foot to control the microscope, right. and you're really trying to focus in and out of of uh, where you are, and um, you know, and the other foot is controlling the vitrectomy machine. So you're you're basically engaging vitreous and tissue at different speeds, and you you sort of have to get into certain planes, uh, and things do happen fairly quickly, and uh, you have to be effective at at uh, delaminating or segmenting uh, tissue. Uh, without really making breaks or making tears and uh, and causing problems, you know. So so, not so only you've got to do all this all all at the same time, right. and and with all this, it's always or you, you always have to be thinking, you know, five steps ahead of well, if this is going to happen, what am I going to do? If that's going to happen, what do we do? You know, that's the uh, that's that's kind of like I believe the the most important part of retina so surgery. So the F sixteen fighter not. So right. what you're saying is you're like Tom Brady and Tom Cruise all in one. All in one. <laughs> that's right. That, that's that's pre- right. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now the retina is extremely thin. It's like right. paper thin. I think right. it's about a quarter of a millimeter thin at, that's at correct. its thinnest yeah. point. Yeah. yeah. So we're talking about something that's paper thin. You're right. looking under a microscope, which right. magnifies it about 10, yeah. 15 times. Right. And you're peeling apart layers of a piece of paper under Correct. a microscope. Correct. Right. So everything so has to be exact. Exact. And but precise. the m- most important point is understanding which plane you're in. Right. That's the most important point. Right. Is That's being in the correct, understanding the plane and being exactly where you need to be. So in the plane, in the F-16. In the surgical plane, it's same. that's right. Same, same thing same as deal. the F-16. Same deal. Yeah. Good. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, some of my patients occasionally come in out of the blue and have a retinal detachment. Just right. They have no previous problems. Right. They just kind of wake up one morning right. and they can't see out of an eye. Right. Can you tell us what a retinal detachment is? Sure. So there's the gel in the back of the eyes called the vitreous gel. <clears throat> if we go back to our model, this is really what takes up the whole, about, about four-fifths of the eye, essentially. And what happens is, is that as we get old, when we're born, this gel is 90% gel and 10% liquid. As we get older, it becomes 50% gel and 50% liquid. And when the gel liquefies, it pulls on the retina. And when it pulls on the retina, it can make a tear. The liquefied gel can then go through the tear, and that can then detach the retina. So that's a classic regmatogenous, what we call a regmatogenous attachment. There's also, you can get a retinal detachment from diabetes too, as we discuss also, is that the scar tissue from diabetics, it, well, it contracts and it pulls. And when it pulls, it, the, retina, the retina as well can detach. It's kind of like a rubber, a rubber band attached to the retina. And it right, kind of a little bit. It kind of like it. makes a tabletop and it, it uh, you know. So why do young people, let's say you're 30 years old, why does a 30-year-old get a retinal detachment well, out of the blue? Well, some, sometimes 30-year-olds, uh, they, they could be myopic or very nearsighted. And the, the, just the characterization of the co- protein to collagen ratio is different in myopes than it is in, in non-myopes, in people who, who are emotropic or, or don't need glasses. And um, the gel liquefies at an earlier rate in these patients. Now, sometimes also these patients, what happens is they, they can have predisposing lesions called lattice degeneration and or, and or retinal holes. And their pathology sometimes when they detach is a bit different, where sometimes the vitreous gel percolates through these retinal holes and through the lattice degeneration, and they actually detach without the gel being pulled off. And it does. It is a bit of a difference in in how you treat the two. 
Right. Now, so, you can treat certain retinal tears or detachments with laser, and others require so, actual surgery, right? So, right. So, so if there's just a retinal tear, the, the retina will be, could, is still adherent to the choroid, the layer under the retina, and you can basically seal this detachment closed with laser, so this tear closed with laser. If fluid gets under the retina, then some form of surgical procedure has to be performed. And sometimes we can't fix this in the office if it's very, if it's, if, if depending on the geography of the tear on, on how high up it is on the eye, so to speak, how many tears there are. Sometimes we can treat this with a, with a gas bubble in the office where the gas bubble expands against the tear. The retinal pigment epithelium pumps out the fluid and the retina reattaches and then we put in laser at a later date. Sometimes we, that, that can happen. Um, most of the time, though, we do wind up going to the operating room to perform a procedure called a vitrectomy with or without a band or, that we sew around the eye called a scleral buckle, where we uh, take out the gel from the back of the eye and we reattach the retina, drain the fluid, either using heavy liquids, actually air conditioner fluid, to, 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 right. to squeegee the fluid uh, from behind the retina. Uh, or we make a drain. We just make a retinotomy. Make a drainage retinotomy. We just aspirate the fluid from under the retina, and then we put in laser, and then we put in a gas bubble. Interesting. Yeah. Um, I've been seeing more and more patients who have something called macular holes, and right. they wind up having macular surgery, Correct. which is right. relatively new. Can you right. tell us about that? Well, the macular hole surgery has been has has been around for a while. The macular hole surgery is in its modern state has really been in existence for about 20 years. But as time has gone on, um, the, the results are better, basically, because the uh, instrumentation is better. Uh, we use small incision surgery. The small the instruments from the, uh, the forceps are in, are in many ways better than the older forceps were. There are, there are dyes that we use now to stain the internal limiting membrane of the retina, and which is the crucial point of closing a macular hole. Uh, essentially what happens, the question really then becomes, well, why does somebody get a macular hole? Right. So uh, there are, you know, two or three theories as far as how someone gets a macular hole. It's either the vitreous gel that we discussed pulls and makes a macular hole. Sometimes membranes on the surface of the macula have a tangential pull, and this causes swelling around the fovea, and the hydraulic force of the swelling pops the hole open. And sometimes even just the internal limiting membrane of the retina, which is a normal part of the retina, as time goes on, this as well causes the same effect of causing the centripetal force that, that pops the hole open. So often just peeling the internal li limiting membrane of the retina effectively and accurately is the most important part of closing the macular. Is this really, the most important part is removing the vitreous gel. If you, even if you just remove the vitreous gel, Perhaps 90% of holes can close even from just that alone. Right. But the, the, the difficult ones, uh, removing the internal limiting membrane of the retina is really the, the key. And, um, and the, basically the dyes that are in use today do make, and the instrumentation, do make it somewhat easier than it was even 10 years ago. Yeah, so, I, I see patients now yeah. who've had macular holes. And they had look great. They yeah. look great. They look great. Their vision's yeah, their restored. Vision's restored. Whereas yeah. 15, 20 yeah. years ago, no, they, they, so were, we, they were. Yeah, it wasn't that you got they good were closure. Doomed. The visions are definitely better, I think, today than they were than they were years ago. Right. So yeah. uh, technology, so, once again, in medicine, is, advances. definitely advances and uh, absolutely helps us. Mm. You know. Tell your your busy guys I mentioned right. earlier. You're yeah. always helping out right. uh, your colleagues and patients. Tell us what your average week is like. What what do you do with with uh, ophthalmology and your retina practice? I, I I just work all day. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> I just see patients all day and I operate. That's essentially what I do. It's it's very simple. That's all it. Right. That's my week. Well, you know. That that's great so, that you're doing that. I yeah. I've seen many of your patients who have other eye issues and right. they're all. Very happy and have yeah. fantastic results. So I, I'd like to thank you very much, Ari, today pleasure. for for coming uh, for yeah. this interview. You've shed a lot of light and information about. Thank uh, you very the much. Eye. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, and the retina, and thank you uh, in the audience for listening and watching this uh, on Twitter. Uh, we're going to have some more doctor podcasts in the very near future. Although I start out with two ophthalmology subjects, I am moving on to other specialties such as gastroenterology, mm -hmm. cardiology, and other specialties. Yes. 
So please uh, stay tuned. Thank you.